join me in the call to worship. Scripture reveals the creative and living spirit of God. When the day of Pentecost had come, they, they were all together in one place. Here we are. On this day, we celebrate the loving and transforming spirit of God. Here we are, O God. Send your Holy Spirit. Fill with the Holy Spirit, God's people will do God's will. Here we are, O God. Please pray with me. Lord, it is good to gather on this Sabbath day. Blessed are we, O God, who you have claimed as your own. We humbly call on you, O God, and patiently wait for your Spirit's direction. Move us, O Lord, and fill your people with love. May our time of worship be pleasing and acceptable to you and serve your purposes for the church and the world. Amen. Our first hymn is hymn 539, uh, found in the Methodist hymnal. children that are here this morning to come and join me for a moment. So glad you're all here this morning to celebrate what we call Pentecost, probably not a, a celebration or a holiday that you've had on your calendar, but uh, it's a very special time 
because at a time when we remember how things began for us as a church. But I also like to think about it as a time when God did a wonderful thing of sharing. Sharing spirit, love with all of us and making us very special people. So what I want to do this morning, I want everyone to take one little tile, and we're going to talk about everyone's tile. So you just pick one. Just one. Here you go. Here you go, Cora. Do you want to take one for your sister? You want to? Sisters, I didn't yeah, I see. Okay, you want to take one? Who doesn't have a tile? Tile? You want to have a? T- You'll have to show me your letter. Leah, you want to get one? <coughs> Melody, would you like a tile? No? Would you like Leah to get you one? Okay. Here you go. Take two. All right. I'm going to have to make this quick. And we'll see how I do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your tile, I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to say something about you as a person. Ah! (laughs) Look at you, it finally happened, a blank tile. (laughs) Well, what this means to me about you, Saffron, is that there's just all kinds of things happening on this blank tile. We can't see it, just like we can't see what God's going to do with you next year in terms of your music, or your school, or your friends. But I believe when you get a blank tile, it just means that God's got big plans that we just don't know about yet. So you hold on, okay? Something wonderful is going to happen. All right, let's go from here. Okay, what do you have? Nile, great, gee. I think of this when I think of you and all the little things that uh, I've been observing, and the big things, like your music, I know you're a soccer player, and so I'm, I know God's going to do good things with you. And maybe the G's for God, too, but good things are going to happen. What do you have, Leah? Do you have a letter for me? Ugh. I, hmm, intelligent. You always make me think. And I know that you're intelligent because you're always thinking of creating creative ways of being Leah. I remember, and I have a picture of you when you were dressed up as a Harry Potter student. And I always thought that was so neat. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. And it makes me think about how smart you are about being Leah. So I, for you. What do you have there? What do you got? What do you got? Oh! I'm thinking. What can I say about O? Oh. Huh? That's a Q. That's oh. A Q. <laughs> no, it's an O. <laughs> what can I say about, what can we say about Q? Quiet? No, Q? Does that how we spell cute? Quiet? Cute. What can we say about quiet? Cute. Quiet or quack? Quack and quiet. Quack and quiet. Do you quack? No. Are you quiet sometimes? You know, when we're quiet, Sometimes we can hear um, God. Is that true? When we're quiet, we need to go to bed. But I'm also saying, when we're quiet, sometimes we hear God whispering to us how much God loves us and how special you are. So it's nice to be quiet sometimes, even before going to bed. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Little sister, what do you got? A. Hmm. A. What can we put here for A? Amazing. Amazing. I think you're right. What else? Awesome. Adorable. Adorable. Awesome and amazing. That's you, right? And that's our God, too. A God who says all the time, seeing you in the quiet, you are amazing, you are awesome, and you are adorable. God bless you. Spirit gifts. What do you got? C. 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 C for my brother's name. What about C for you? Q. Q. Huh? Q? Q? Yeah, yeah. What else? 
Hmm? <laughs> cut, cut. Oh no. Cats. Cat. Cat. You like cats? Kitty yeah. Cat. K for kitty cats, right? So C. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. C. 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 Cute. Yes. Yeah. You know what? The spirit's gonna tell me, and I'll tell you later as I think about this, Hannah. C. I'm waiting for the spirit in the quiet to tell me something awesome and adorable about you, and I'm sure it will become clear. C. What do we got? What do you got? Gemma has an O. O. Gemma. Gemma has an O. So what can we say about O and Gemma? Oh. Oh. <laughs> odd is Gemma? No. Gemma. We're all odd in some ways. God made us all a little odd so we could be different. Yeah, oh, what can we think about this? We'll have to keep waiting and the spirit will maybe give me some, some insights in terms of oh. Dad, do you have any help with O for Gemma? Oops, <laughs> yeah, oops. <laughs> That's a great, thank you, Kevin. That's awesome, yeah, oops. Oh, well, <laughs> that's okay. God forgives us when we, oops, God, sorry. <laughs> what do you got? E. What do we think, Cora? E is, you're a hard worker, right, in school and getting ready for school. Excellent, right? Excellent. You like to do things well, right? <coughs> right? So maybe God is going to continue to give you the spirit gift of excellence. Wonderful. All right, we're down to the last one. What do we got? You don't have one? You don't have one? Okay. Well, we'll catch up. We don't need letters. We're going to figure it out. Don't worry. Oh, what do we have? Whose is this? Whose letter is it? Melody's T. T. You know what I just came to my mind, Melanie? How terrific, but how you like to set up tea parties. Because I watched you the other day downstairs at um, Fun Fridays, and you were setting up a tea party for all your friends. Yeah. And you know what that means? You like to, well, I do. I do. And you loved doing it, and you set it up for your doll friends, and you were so kind, sharing and making space at the table for everybody. Terrific job, Melanie. Tea for tea parties. We'll be there. Thank you for all your letters. And let's put our hands together and bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you for the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit that have fallen upon these children, known and unknown. Bless them as they learn their gifts and their talents and bring them forward for your will and your way in the world. And hear us, O Lord, as we join our voices together into one as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The scripture for today is found in Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were be bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in, their, in our own language to which we were born? 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the 11, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is still speaking. Our next hymn is Gather Us In, in the Faith We Sing hymnal. We're singing verses 1, 2, and 4. we thank you for this beautiful morning. We call upon your Holy Spirit on this day of thanksgiving and remembrance. Send your spirit into our midst. Speak to us in the words that we share and understand as your common message of love. Help us to open our hearts and minds to what your message is for us on this day, this day of new beginnings, of new community, 
and new opportunities. May our time and thoughts and meditations be pleasing and expect, acceptable to you, O Lord. Amen. When I'm putting together a sermon, I have the, the habit of sticking to the traditional manuscript model that I was taught uh, a long time ago. I seem to have never really broken out of that traditional model. There's different ways for a preacher to prepare his or her outline or manuscript, and I pretty much stick to the traditional format. And to make it easier to refer to and to read, I double space it. So there's plenty of room for me to make notes as well as just make it easier to read. I use the same font that I've been using since the beginning, Times Roman. I put bold and underlining and all that kind of stuff that helps me uh, to see things that at the time I thought were important. And maybe to your surprise, I do consider time when I'm putting together my manuscript. <laughs> I really do. And you know, since coming to Belmont, I've been, uh, you've helped me, seriously, <laughs> in a good way. Pay attention to time, which means that I have to be more constructive and intentional about what I'm going to say. But the manuscript, and I've said this to a few of you, is not the problem or the issue, which really isn't a problem. The manuscript, if I sat here and read what I have up here in front of me right now, maybe it would take three minutes. Some of you would vote for that. <laughs> I understand, it doesn't offend me, but that's the manuscript, right? But what's going on between the lines is what I say to folks becomes the preaching often. What I'm saying now to you is nothing that's printed right here. It's between the lines. I'm gonna glance down and say, you better get to that point because you're going off track. But my point is, is that when we write our sermons, I think most preachers would, would agree that uh, a fair amount of what the sermon is, and we could probably say that this is preaching, has nothing to do with just ink on paper, but is what comes from between the lines. It's the unwritten. And I'll underline this. Sometimes spirit-directed words or message. It's between the lines that comes forth when you step in the pulpit or on the altar and you glance at your manuscript, but all of a sudden you feel that God is actually using you as an instrument to bring God's word forward. Not that preparing the manuscript and doing all the hard research and all the study isn't part of the work of being the instrument of God's work. But all of a sudden you feel like you're going in a direction that maybe you had not thought about. But God has laid on your heart as a way of articulating or going a little further with the, the message that God wants God's people to hear at this time and place. And so this is why reading the manuscript outside of the, the preaching will provide key points key points, one, two, and three, whatever standard procedure you use, but it's not the preaching always. It's not the message that we're called to share. It's not the conversation that God wants to have with us at this particular time and place. And so what I say is that the open space between the lines on a manuscript is the workplace of the Spirit. It's the workplace of God, God using us, in the words that we share in language, to share God's message, the good news, the message of love, transformation, of justice, and peace. But they're words that God has inspired. Now, again, as I said, not all the words that come from that space between the lines are always God-inspired. Sometimes they're just notions or ideas or things or stories that just come to mind to the preacher because they're just there in the back of his or her mind, and it, it feels like it's 
something that ought to be said. And so the difference, how do we figure out what's happening between the lines? Is the preacher telling a story because he or she thinks it's good, or is it God-inspired? How do we tell the difference? Well, that's up to the listener and the preacher to do the work of the interpretation. I mean, sometimes we, 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 we can just know, well, that's him telling or her telling a story to, to make a point. That, I don't feel any inspiration, but sometimes the words make a particular connection to our hearts or our minds, and we feel that there is something else going on here. It may happen once a year, it may happen every Sunday, it may not happen for a long time, but all of a sudden, the words that come from that sermon or that preaching engagement, preacher, lay, or ordained, all of a sudden there is this particular connection, there's particular time and place that becomes holy. And you may share that with the preacher later, that connected with me, I felt God you said that or when you were telling that story. And sometimes the preacher will say, well, I, I, that's, that's good because I didn't feel God at that time. And so it can be within the hearts and minds of both the listener and the preacher when we get in between the lines of the text. And so we gather this Sunday to celebrate Pentecost. It's the time we revisit every year, every year. We come to Pentecost. But as I said earlier, it's the time when we need to remember and come into the presence of the Lord with thanksgiving because it has its roots in the holy Jewish celebration of the Feast of Weeks. For those who had the capacity would travel to Jerusalem, bring the best of the best from their crops, their oil, their fruits, and leave them at the altar for the priest to enjoy and to turn into products so they could have income. But it's also a celebration of God's word. It's a celebration for the people of Israel, for Jews, where they recognize that God had given them special words. In the Torah, and specifically the Ten Commandments. So it's a celebration of words. It's important for us who celebrate God's work on this day of Pentecost to understand that God's engagement with God's people with words, with text, has been taking place long before the birth of the church, long before there was a, a Pentecost in Christian terms. God's word had already been given to God at the time of the Pentecost that we're celebrating and we heard about in Acts chapter 2. But the thing is, and what we learn from, from this text, is that God's message was not complete. Although many who were listening, Jews from all around the world, the Jewish world, may have thought that God had completed God's message and all those scrolls, the Torah, but they came to understand with the power and the gift of the Spirit that God had something else to say, that there was something in between those lines and the scrolls of the Torah, that there was something more in between the lines of each commandment. What is important about God's message in this time of Pentecost is that God shares a message with a very diverse group of people. The message that comes forth from between the lines is for a very diverse group of people. In other words, God is giving good news, new news, to a group of people with a variety of languages. It wasn't that God was demanding, oh, the Spirit should put everyone into the same language box, and so that all are speaking the same language. At Pentecost, a variety of languages came, and others were speaking languages that they had not spoken before, but they were able to communicate, and those who were outside this Pentecost experience all of a sudden well, aren't they all Galileans? Aren't they, shouldn't they just be speaking in this way with that funny accent? And by the way, what are they doing drinking so early? 
They weren't in the same place, in the same time. And so here's this group, a large group of believers gathered in one place. I don't know how they all fit in that one place. They talk about it as one room. And the different commentaries talk about whether this is a text for the, the 11, the disciples, or this is a text for the other 100 or so people that are gathered, or is it a text for everybody? I think it's there for everybody. But here it is. They are gathered in this one place, and all of a sudden, God decides to do God's work. And in the midst of this new community that had been formed, God's work is being proclaimed. The great deeds and power of God are being shouted out and praise and thanksgiving and it's all there in a variety of languages a new chemistry it was Peter's task that representative of the church to do the best he could with the critics that were there and even those that were spirit filled to interpret what's going on here right now and so what does he do he takes his text as any preacher would do, and he takes the text and he, he starts preaching on the prophet Joel as a way of revealing and opening up what is happening here. What did God promise and what has God done with us? So Peter starts to interpret God's message and he goes back to those prophetic words to explain God's engaging work with God's people. God's work that is so central to us being Pentecost people. It's our work to do the, the work that Peter does by taking scripture and using it to explain and understand and to interpret God's presence and work with us. It's God's work with us as Pentecost people that allows us to live and act from between the lines in scripture. We take our directives from the gospel and from, from the Hebrew Bible, but it's, it's what happens with us in between those lines and how we interpret them and put them into action that enables us to grow mission and ministry in ways that all of a sudden start to cause many Pentecost among people who may not have ever expected to be brought into a, a community or a gathering where other languages are spoken and other people are gathered that maybe one or two have never encountered before. God's life-giving and life-transforming spirit as promised by Jesus. The same spirit that led him into the wilderness after that same spirit had baptized him, led him into the wilderness and he became his promise. The spirit that came down upon the people in Pentecost has always been there. But in between the lines and the experience, it was hard for some disciples to interpret it. And so it was the gift of the Holy Spirit that gave birth to this new faith community, this new expression that we continue to celebrate on this day and we continue to live into. We must not forget the powerful and creative and loving role of the Spirit. That we reside in between the lines. It is this space in between the lines that our story, our lives, it's the workplace of God. It's where God is working with us. And without that space, the church would not exist. It's this time of year that we celebrate the hard work of students who have reached the end of their studies, have completed their programs, their years in high school, or all years in public school, private school, or university, whatever it is, it's this time of year where we pause and we, we acknowledge and remember the hard work that's been done. And each student, in most cases, gets a certificate, right? A diploma. And it's got words and fancy script on it, and it's got all kinds of signatures and stamps and maybe ribbons. It's just a wonderful document to have and maybe put on the wall. And while each student receives a written document certifying the completion of their study, there is so much more written or spoken into that document that will come from between the lines of 
those words of acknowledgement, those words that recognize excellence. And many students will come to fill the spaces between the lines on their diploma with opportunities and possibilities in directions they never thought they would ever go in. You've spoken to students and received degrees in a particular area, whether it's engineering or sciences or biology, and they're doing something completely different. It has nothing to do with what the diploma says. Why is that? Well, there could be a number of factors, uh, experience and opportunity. But I also think it's between the lines on the, on the diploma that God is doing God's work compelling and moving students in a particular direction to do something that maybe was never on their professional radar screen, but came up through their hearts and made decisions, maybe even at the expense of a lower salary or becoming a volunteer or becoming someone that... Uh, is going to work in the inner city, or maybe whatever it is, but it, it's not on the diploma, it's in between the lines. We must pray for our young students as they go forth with or without diploma in hand, that God will speak to them in a way that will allow them to fulfill their lives as the profession that they studied calls for, but also as people of faith. And so God is not absent in the midst of God's people when we turn to Scripture. God is active. God gets in between the lines of all of God's people, always looking for ways to bring forth God's deeds of power, always looking for ways to move God's people into proclamation, into declaration, into making visible God's deeds of power and love. We're talking about the full expression of God and God's love and the possibilities and opportunities that come to us. And are we willing to study scripture or to use scripture in a way that allows us to go in between the lines. Or sometimes the hardest work gets done. And where we find ourselves encouraged and challenged and inspired. This work that comes between the lines is not just to be experienced. It's not a purely Pentecostal experience where we feel the Spirit lifting us up and moving us in a particular direction. It's a, and it's experienced to be lived into. Just as the Pentecost experience was not just one, okay, we've experienced God's Spirit, we're, we're on fire, let's go fishing. No. They were moved out into the communities. They broke up into small groups, one to one, a couple at a time and found ways to continue the Pentecost experience and to be able to bring the same message to others so that others could feel like they had a friend in the Holy Spirit, that it was accompanying them and carrying them forward in life. And so when we do see a young person moving in a direction that is spirit-led, a new graduate, a young adult, we see God at work, God engaging God's people in a way that bring that fullness of life and new opportunities for living, that substance, that fruit, that first fruit that comes from between the lines. And it's all sure and good to understand that there are certain vocations and occupations that, that lend themselves to us to make it easier to see God's spirit at work, but there are others that, that it just happens. And it could happen outside of the professional or vocational arena, but maybe it happens in the life of that young person as a neighbor in an apartment complex. We do not know how the spirit is going to engage, but we must be open to what happens between the lines. What is certain 
is that God's Spirit is at work. Whether we acknowledge it, feel it, God's Spirit is at work in our midst. And the church is at its best when it encourages all people, and particularly I want to focus on young people, to be open to God working with them. To be open and responsive to God working along their side. To encourage, to give the power of risk-taking. But not to live on autopilot but to expect God to speak and share in the guidance. The preacher Peter used the prophet Joel's words, and he preached from between the lines. And came from that preaching a new message, which we are all recipients of. A spirit-filled message that God was filling hearts and filling minds with visions and dreams. Peter wasn't talking about ancient times. He was talking about what was happening then. That spirit, those flames that came upon the minds and the hearts was a source of visions and dreams. We too, as a people of God, we have visions and dreams and must call on the spirit to help us interpret them and to give us new ones if we need them. It's a task of the church to be the recipient, to be the vessel of visions and dreams from which the source is the Spirit. And so our church and all churches were part of the story of being written and guided on God's schedule. God puts down what's going to happen in the calendar. God puts down where we're going as a church. It's our task to be actively open to the Spirit so that we can interpret and understand and receive the gifts to take advantage of the opportunities of visions and dreams that God lays upon us. And I truly believe it's that plan that's written between the lines. I can't see it. I can talk about it. I can be open to it, but I can't see it. It's not written just yet. It's not clear. But it's there. I believe it. And I pray that together, as we work as a community of faith, that we won't be afraid to well, what's between the lines here? What do we need to do to get to that? Do we need to pray? Do we need to invite others to help interpret what's between the lines? What's God got planned for us? I just believe that it's a plan that is written out between the lines. Where God's work often happens in the most powerful ways. May God's life-giving spirit bless each and every one of you on this Pentecost Sunday. And bless our church as we move forward as Pentecost people. Amen. I invite you to pray with me this morning. You may remember some of the prayer requests from last week, uh, or maybe not. Um, or maybe you weren't here. Um, but I, I've been thinking about a few people, praying for a lot of people, but thinking more about what's happening in the in the Midwest with the floods, having come from uh, Tennessee earlier this week and meeting with folks from the Midwest and seeing pictures of the floods and how devastated areas are. Um, I'm just mindful that people's lives have been completely, uh, radically changed and uprooted uh, communities. So please, let's keep those that are suffering from the floods uh, in our minds, and if there's an opportunity to support relief, I, I pray that you'll do that. Um, also, thinking about Crystal Waller's uh, uh, brother uh, down in Texas. Thinking about, I, I really appreciate Sandy's email who helped make the connection to me how he's been to worship and connected to the church and um, 
just made me also think of other young people living with cancer and I just want to encourage you to pray um, for all folks that you know that are living with cancer others that are on your hearts and minds this morning let us pray Lord you have heard our words of thanks and joy You've heard our call for unity and prayer for those that are living with cancer. We pray, O oh Lord, for those that are traveling from this place and to this place. We pray, O oh God, and give thanks for this opportunity to be the church and to extend ourselves in ways that maybe a few years ago we never thought would be possible. We thank you, O oh God, for the history of this church, the Pentecost movement of Methodists in this place, a story that has been written but is far from completion. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit your holy and loving and life-giving spirit will come into our midst and our hearts and help us and guide us to do what you so will for us. May it be your pen. May you be the author of our future for ministry and mission. And may we, your people, interpret and be faithful and obedient. We pray, O oh Lord, for all those that are suffering in mind, body, or spirit, especially young people living with cancer. Pray for healing and strength, and for those that are in the midst of recovery. May your spirit, your life-giving spirit, be a source of guidance and strength and inspiration. We pray, O oh Lord, on this day for all the graduates and that your spirit will aid in their understanding of the value that they bring into life, of the great spirit-filled qualities that they have to share to make a difference in this world. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the opportunity to have risen up on this beautiful day and to find our way here to be your people in this place and time. All this and much more we pray in your name. Amen. Let us rededicate ourselves, our lives, to the work of Jesus Christ in this place and far away, and to offer our gifts and our tithes to support this work.
Please pray with me our prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. you to remain standing if you're comfortable doing so as we sing our concluding hymn, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. As we go into the future uh, from this day forward until we meet again next Sunday, I pray that um, maybe you'll look between the lines of your, your messages that you receive on your phone. And, you know, what other information is there? Is there a call for prayer when you receive a text for a friend or an email? Is there something between the lines when you pick up the, the Boston Globe and that's inspiring you to think about in terms of your life as a Christian or as part of a community? What's between the lines for us in our lives? What's God's Spirit calling us to do or be next? Uh, may we be open to the Pentecost movement as we surely are Pentecost people. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.